Hi guys, please like, share and subscribe. And if you want full course for any actual subject, visit theactualguy.com or WhatsApp on this number. Thank you. Now, what is the exam pathway? Let's talk about this, right? So here, if you look at this diagram, you have got first set of exams, which are called as the core principles, right? Uh, which is your CM, CS and CB exams. So there are two CS exams, two CM exams and three CB exams here, right? These are your foundational subjects, basically. Then you have your core uh, practices, which are your CP exams, actual practice, modeling practice, communication practice. All of these exams are mandatory to write. There are no options between multiple exams. You have to take all of them. These are the first 10 exams. Once you pass these exams and you have two years of professional and personal development, that is basically your work experience. If you have two years of work experience and uh, you have passed all of these exams, you become an associate of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, right? And you can use the words uh, AIA at the end of your name. So that is your uh, associateship, right? That's the first uh, sort of stage uh, towards, uh, you know, qualifying as an actuary. Even an associate actuary can be considered as an actuary, but they are not specialized. So after this, you write your specialization exams, which would be your SP and SA exams. Uh, SP exams, you have got uh, four and uh, three. And there's also one more. Uh, so uh, there's banking exam, which has been added as well. So th there are a total of eight exams. Out of these, you have to write two exams. Uh, you will have to choose any two. And then with essay exams, you've got five options and you write one of them, right? And this you do based on your specialization, whatever you've picked, right? So we have got a couple of them, health and care, life insurance, uh, finance and investment, general insurance, all of these are your specialization. And as I told you, now banking has also been ad added, right? So you do this and you have three years of total experience. So two and then one more year of experience here, then you qualify as a fellow actuary. So that's how you complete your qualification. Now, what do these exams cover? Let's talk about that. So your CS1 is your basic and advanced statistics. This would cover typically slightly more than the university level uh, elective for statistics. Uh, it would start at your random variable theory and then go all the way up till your Bayesian statistics theory. Then you have your CM1, which covers the basics of cash flow modeling and the mathematics of life insurance, right? So all of this is covered uh, here. Uh, then you have your CS2, which is your survival modeling exam. So you uh, talk about how do you model mortality of people or populations, right? Uh, then it covers introduction to time series analysis, machine learning, and basics of general insurance pricing. So all of these things are covered here. CM2 covers financial engineering and uh, general insurance reserving, right? So these are your CM and CS exams. These are the mathematically intense exams. Uh, for each one of these exams, you have a paper A and you have a paper B. Paper A is Microsoft Word based in case of IFO and paper B is software uh, based application. For CM1, CM2, paper B is MS Excel based and for CS1, CS2, paper B is R programming based, right? So that is uh, your uh, CM, CS exams. Now next are your business exams, which are CB1, 2 and 3. CB1 is finance and financial accounting. CB2 is business economics and CB3 is business awareness module. These are very easy, straightforward exams. Uh, can be done if you are really good at exam writing, even under 50 hours, you can study for them and get done with them. If you want to study them properly, 100 hours is more than enough, right? So these are your uh, CB1, CB2 and CB3 uh, sort of exams. And then you have your CP series, which is CP1 is uh, principles of actual practice, uh, which are about your subjective judgment while working as an actuary. That is what it uh, uh, covers. And how do you go about, uh, you know, working as an actual professional? It's uh, broadly guidance on that thought process, right? So that is what CP1 is broadly about. Then CP2 is the Excel modeling exam. So you do your uh, uh, modeling, you build uh, models on Microsoft Excel here. 
and your CP3 is the communications exam. It's a advanced level uh, English language exam uh, with a focus on communicating with non-technical stakeholders. So how do you write actual reports? How do you write emails? All of those things, right? Fairly straightforward, easy exam again. Uh, CP2 and CP3 are very easy. CP1 is huge, right? So they uh, can be sort of clubbed with other exams, CP2 and CP3. CP1, you probably have to take alone. And it, it is the biggest actuarial science exam. And uh, it has a reputation for notorious being notoriously difficult to qualify. Uh, then you have your SPs and SAs. Uh, you have to pass two SP exams and one SA exam. Right, this I've already talked about. So now, what would be your ideal exam progression if you are starting at university? This is what I'm talking about in a lot of detail. Obviously, if you are beyond university, you can also go with a similar pathway. But here I've structured it in a way where I'm talking to students who are still at university and a first or second year of their university. How do they uh, complete the course as fast as possible? Because again, Qualifying faster is a really good thing, right? If someone tells you don't do too many exams uh, too fast, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, there is no problem with passing more exams earlier, right? So that I can uh, tell you with a lot of confidence. Do them as fast as possible. Get done with as many during university so that uh, you don't have to write too many along with your job. That is what I would recommend. Now, uh, this is a given if you want to do well in actual science, if you don't want to get stuck with exams too much, CS1, CM1, CS2, CM2, these four exams you have to definitely get done in your university. Uh, with the first four semesters of your college, you get done with all four of these. Uh, whatever I talk about after this is ideal, but this is bare minimum. This in three or four years of your college, you should get done with these four. Now, if you are someone who is really smart and dedicated, what would be the ideal path? Let me talk about that. So CS1, CM1, CS2, CM2, along with first four semesters of college. If you have additional bandwidth, if your college is like really light or you have less number of courses there, then along with your CS1 and CM2 exam, uh, respectively, you can add uh, CB1 and CB2, reason for that is very simple, CS1 and CM2 are smaller than CM1 and CS2, so these are exams you can take alongside other exams and CB1, CB2 as I told you are very easy to do, so you just couple these two, right, CB1 with CS1 and CB2 with CM2 or the other way around, that's also okay, but uh, both CM2 and CB2 have an economics undertone, so I would say you couple them. Uh, if you are feeling too enthusiastic, and you know you can couple your CB2 exam along with uh, uh, maybe CS2 or uh, CM1. Then I would say you can also couple CP2 with CM2 because CP2 and CM2 have an overlap. Uh, CM2 paper B is Excel and your CP2 is also an Excel modeling exam. So there is a good overlap there. You can take both of them together. So that is how you sort of get done with your uh, CS, CM, CB and hopefully your CP2 exam as well. Now, if you are pursuing a three year deg degree course, then alongside your fifth semester, you can wrap up any CM, CS, CB exams that are remaining. If by this time also you are, you have not been able to, you know, sort of qualify and you're, you were doing only one exam at a time. So say you have done CS1, CM1, CS2, CM2, um, you know, per semester. Uh, then what you do is this semester you take up CB1, CB2 or you take CB1, CB2, CB3, right? Uh, you sort of get done with all of these CM, CS, CB exams by your fifth semester. That would be ideal. And then in the sixth semester, you can start studying for subject CP1, right? So that in the first couple of months of your job, you can uh, complete CP1. You've already studied in your last semester and then you can actually as soon as you uh, go to work you can uh, write cp1 if you are in a four year degree course i would say get done with cp1 in college itself don't wait for your job to start cp1 takes a good amount of effort 
uh, get done with CP1 in your college itself. It will give you a good flavor of what it is like to work in the actual industry as well if you write CP1 in college. Then in the first six months of your job or the second uh, uh, six months of your job, depending on whether you're coming from a three year course, four year course, whatever your exam progression has been, I would say get done with CP2 and CP3 uh, together. These are very straightforward, easy exams to write. They'll be easy to do while you're adjusting in your job. So by this time, you've completed all this and uh, you know you are on your part to become an associate actually as soon as you have two years of experience, right? And then after this, you uh, can um, take up the two SP and one SA exams uh, based on whatever area you're working in. These you can take easy because you have some time remaining now. Uh, and uh, sort of absorb whatever you're working on at your workplace and write these exams alongside. I would say experiment with multiple roles uh, in the industry before settling down into one role, right? Uh, most of uh, the people, what they do is they start working in general insurance, work in general insurance for the rest of your life. Don't do that. Sample through. Uh, work in uh, general insurance, your first internship maybe, then you take up a job in life insurance, you know, sort of sample through. Uh, there will be a disadvantage in the beginning of doing this because uh, uh, companies won't be very happy with you hopping around, right? But from a career point of view, there's a definite advantage uh, because you would be able to see all areas of work under the actuarial spectrum and choose whichever one is the best one for you. So I would say sample through different uh, areas of uh, work, right? And eventually, if you start your practice, if you worked in other areas in the past, you would be able to set up consulting for uh, uh, those areas as well, right? So I would say in the initial one, two, three years of your career, sample through multiple different uh, kinds of actual uh, roles. Even if you have settled onto a business, if you've selected general insurance, do reserving first, then do pricing, whatever, right? So mix and match. That's what I would recommend. Okay. Now let's talk about the cost of writing exams from IFOA. So you can either be eligible for reduced rate of the exams or you will have to pay the full rate. The eligibility for reduced rate is based on this. So for a student, it is if your own personal income is less than 8700 uh, pounds, which is roughly, I think, about rupees 9 lakhs. So if your own income, not what your parents are making, just your own income is less than uh, 9 lakh rupees, then you'd be eligible for the reduced rate. Now, if you are at the reduced rate, the total cost of qualifying to fellow is about 3 lakh 31 thousand rupees, uh, which in pounds is 3145 pounds. This is uh, obviously a significant portion of this will be paid by your employer once you start working, right? So you'd probably only have to pay for these initial exams. If you have a personal income of higher than 900,000, which is unlikely for most uh, uh, students to have, at least in India, so then you will have to pay this full rate. And then the cost of fellowship will be 506,000 rupees, which is 4,800 uh, pounds, right? So that's broadly the cost. You can see the cost of the individual exams. Apart from that, you also have to pay a, an annual membership fee, as I discussed earlier. And the reduced rate of the annual membership fee uh, would be 9,174 uh, rupees, uh, which is uh, 87 pounds. And uh, the full rate will be 275 pounds, which is 29,000 rupees, which is significantly higher, right? Uh, so if once you start earning and your employer is not paying for these things, this can become really costly for you. Uh, for fellows, obviously, this is substantially higher and this is annual, right? So you have to pay it yearly uh, before 31st December uh, of that year. Okay, so that's all uh, about how do you qualify as a fellow actually from IFOA.